Welcome. In this module, we're going to take a look at CIS control number 19, incident response and management, and this is the first part in the series. And the incident response and management is very important because this is how we find out an incident has happened, and then we should have incident management mechanisms in place so that we are able to handle uh, an incident if and when it occurs. So this is the CIS controls version 7 layout, and we're right now in the second last control, control number 19, incident response and management, which is for the organization as a whole. And this is the system entity relationship diagram. Uh, there are third party authorities and incident management plans, which we're going to work with the workforce members and educate them and implement our incident response and management plan. So control 19.1, document incident response procedures. It's very important for the organization to develop a plan for incident management, how the incidents are going to be recorded, analyzed, triaged, or evaluated in terms of what the level of the incident is, and then how is the incident going to be handled. All of this needs to be done in peacetime and documented, and then there need to be training and awareness efforts so that the entire organization is aware of the policy and the SOP for incident response and management. So ensure that there are written incident response plans that define roles of personnel as well as phases of incident handling and management and what needs to be done by who in each of the phases. 19.2, assign job titles and duties for incident response. Assign job titles and duties for handling computer and network incidents to specific individuals and ensure tracking and documentation throughout the incident through resolution. So uh, it's very important that the uh, functions that need to be performed while the incident process is going on, that is defined and those, those roles are assigned to people so that they know that they need to do this and then you need to also do drills. And those people who are supposed to have certain job titles or roles in the incident management process, we actually get them to perform those roles. For example, if there, is a, uh, if there is an incident and there's an evacuation procedure, so there are team leaders who will assist in the evacuation and then there's a person designated or people designated to perform the count um, of the total staff that needs to assemble outside the building if there is an earthquake or if there's any other such uh, incident. 19.3, designate management personnel to support incident handling. Designate management personnel, which is the senior management, as well as backups, who will support the incident handling process by acting in key decision-making roles. So what happens is if there's an incident, then usually the organization is relying on some guidance from some senior manager or, the, or some C-level uh, director, for example. And if those people are not available, then the organization may have confusion because they lack direction or the uh, instructions have not been issued. So here we're saying that we need to designate management personnel also to support the incident handling so that the decisions can be made. 19.4, devise organization-wide standards for reporting incidents. Devise organization-wide standards for time required for system administrators and other workforce members to report anomalous events to the incident handling team. And the mechanisms for such reporting and the kind of information that should be included in the incident notification. So whenever we want to report, we need to have a standard, we need to have a mechanism, it needs to be in the policy, and we need to make sure that everybody is aware that this is the mechanism for reporting the incidents. That's all that we have for this module. Thank you.